then Solomon raised up a temple, there was an interim period. And tonight we're just going to deal with the first part of that interim period. We're not going to deal with David's tabernacle tonight. Um, but the primary event historically between the history of the tabernacle and the history of the temple beginning is 1 Samuel chapter 4. <clears throat> the events in 1 Samuel chapter 4 begin with the Ark of the Covenant representing the life of God being inside that tabernacle. It begins there. It ends, this fourth chapter ends with that Ark no longer being in there. <clears throat> All right? And soon, soon, Solomon, you know, well, soon David will raise up David's tabernacle, and then soon after that, Solomon will raise up the temple. So this is the defining moment of transition between one and the other. We're just going to read, there's a lot here, but we're only going to read, at least right now, we're going to read 11 verses. So beginning with verse 1, and the word uh, uh, the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and encamped beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. <clears throat> and when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, why hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh uh, among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. <clears throat> All right. This is, this is important that you at least know what they just said. Uh, uh, obviously, the most important thing is they are in the process of taking the ark out of the tabernacle. All right. Now, in this story, which is a shadow of the true and does not give clarity to the true story, they're saying we're going we're gonna to take this ark out and we're going to win this battle because the ark of the covenant is among us. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> verse 4, So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who dwelleth between the cherubim, and the two sons of the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phineas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is coming to the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Uh, <clears throat> Verse 9, be strong and acquit yourself like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews as they have been unto you. Acquit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought Israel, uh, fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent, and there was a great slaughter. For there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen, and the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Eli here being the high priest, by the way, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, read a little paragraph again. In the Old Testament, we read that the Philistines took the ark of God at the hands of Israel. <clears throat> the Philistines took the ark of God at the hands of Israel. When Israel took the ark out of the tabernacle and the Philistines took it from them, that was only a shadow. The true picture has more clarity to it than the shadow. The situation that took place that day was a picture of Israel handing Jesus over to the Gentiles for death. Okay, now that's the actual event that happened that was the movement toward the transition from tabernacle to temple. Okay? 
So here in the shadow, we don't get this clear picture. It looks like they're championing the Ark of the Covenant, but when we take it out of the shadow and put it into the true, we know that Israel and the priesthood and all of them took the Ark and handed him over to the Romans with the ex express purpose of putting him to death. Okay? Um, and that picture, <clears throat> that picture is a picture of, remember we talked about the body being like a, a tabernacle and we used New Testament scriptures that bore that out, that Paul uses that term, you know, that if the tabernacle of this body should be dissolved, we have a, you, you remember that? <clears throat> well, the ark of God represents the life of God, the life force of God, the being of God. And when they took the ark out of the tabernacle, that represented death. That's the, that's the death. Now, the fullness of that death is carried out on the Philistine side, who represents spiritually the times of the Gentiles. And I think I've mentioned that somewhere here or have in the past. <clears throat> um, the situation that took place that day was a picture of Israel handing Jesus over to the Gentiles for death. As the ark, representing the life of God, was taken out of the tabernacle, even so the life of Jesus was taken out of his earthly tabernacle, his body. This represented his death on the cross. The Jews handed Jesus over to the Romans in order to put him to death. <clears throat> All right. Interestingly enough, this is exact, I mean, it's a perfect picture. I mean, it's exact in so many ways because that act, okay, we're looking at the New Testament here, and there, but if you'll lay over this, the Old Testament historical picture, when they took the ark out of the, out of the uh, tabernacle and ended up turning it over to the Philistines, <clears throat> As I said, it was the end of the tabernacle system. And uh, it was not only the end of the tabernacle, I mean, with God, as far as God was concerned, because God left. I mean, he, you know, he, he was gone from that from then on, and uh, a whole series of events took place, incredible events pertaining to the priesthood, and pertaining to those sort of things. Eli was back. He's the high priest. He'd been the high priest for 40 years, and 40 is a, is a number of testing. And he'd been the high priest for 40 years, and all of a sudden, the messenger comes back, and he goes, you know, what, what has happened here? And he says, well, bad things have happened, you know. And he goes, well, what? What kind of bad things? And the messenger says, your two sons who were also in, you know, in the priesthood, your two sons are dead. Well, interestingly enough, Eli wasn't, Eli wasn't that affected by that because he represents more than a father worrying over his sons. And then he says, you know, basically says, what else? And the messenger says, the ark of the Lord has been taken by the Philistines. And when he heard that, and this is specifically, when he heard that the ark had been taken, that's very specific, he fell over backwards, broke his neck, and died. At the same moment, uh, who is Phineas' wife, one of the priests, the sons, who also died, okay, so they died, because this cross is killing more than just Jesus, folks. It's killing the old system. It's killing the old covenant. It's killing the old way of doing stuff. So these old priests who were not very good priests in themselves, they're, you know, they have died. Then word gets back to the father who's the high priest, and the high priest of the whole thing dies. And one more event happens basically at the same time, and that is Phineas' wife was pregnant. And she was due, and so the messenger came in and says, your husband's dead, his brother, your father, and the ark has been taken. And when she heard that the ark was taken, she started giving birth, 
and she died. In fact, why don't we, it's, it's short. Let me just read that. That's verse 19 through 22, 1 Samuel 4. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child near to be delivered. When she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman, this is the midwife, who stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it, because why? Because she died. And so this son comes forth, and verse 21, um, and she named the child Ichabod, saying, the glory is departed from Israel. Ichabod meaning the glory is departed. The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband and she said, the glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. All right. Now, controversial point that some people will have a hard time with, and that is, for all intents and purposes, when Jesus died on the cross, the glory departed from Israel and was transferred to the church. Many of you here don't have a problem with that, but there are, there are people out there. They would go, oh, you know, no way. <clears throat> but the, in the New Testament, it's full of that information too. The church is what God is doing. God gave up on the old system, the old covenant. And that's not the best words, but, you know, and established a new covenant with his church, which is the temple. Okay, the tabernacle worship ended. And it didn't just end, it, 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 for all intents and purposes, certainly with God and with the immediate people involved in it, it ended with death. It ended with death here and with death there and with death there and with death there. It was, and it was wiping out the old priesthood. All right, well, read the book of Hebrews and find out that there's a change of priesthood. Okay, Right? And so you begin to see this pattern. You begin to see in this one event, although you need the Holy Spirit to open your eyes, and we're not finished giving the full explanation of it, but you begin to see in the taking of the ark, you, you see that this was more than the shadow. The shadow, you know, the shadow, as I've always said, the shadow is so unclear that you can't get it. But remember other shadows we've discussed? Remember the shadow of, of the uh, Day of Atonement? Everybody remember the Old Testament Day of Atonement? What is it? The high priest comes and, you know, they're all holy and they, he comes and he lays hands on the scapegoat and he passes the sins upon it. You remember that? And it's such a beautiful picture. We all go, oh, we all feel warm, you know, and whatever. Uh, I got news for you. The New Testament picture, the actual reality, not the shadow, is the high priest and all those guys laying hands on Jesus and taking him before Pontius Pilate and laying all the sins, all the blame and all their sins on him. It ain't beautiful. And the high priest ain't holy and whatever. It is It is a, the true being seen for the first time and a true comprehension instead of, you know, us, you know, instead of us making pictures, New Testament pictures of the shadow, well, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, celebrate the Day of Atonement in our church service today. And me as the pastor, I'm dressed up like the high priest. And we're going to actually bring a, an actual goat in here and lay hands on it. And, oh, Lord, you know, and everybody, oh, this is so holy. Folks, those were ruthless people that grabbed Jesus, and, and including high priest and including the leaders, and turned him over to the Romans for death. And it wasn't a beautiful picture, but that's the true picture. This other is a shadow. You'd like to believe that's true. You, you know, you'd like to think that everything was so rosy, but it was only a shadow. And Jesus knew all along, long before he ever came, that that was sort of a really distorted picture of the truth. That the viciousness which with, with, with which they set out to destroy him 
is the true picture. And so you get a similar picture here. Here you have <clears throat> the transition between the tabernacle in the Old Testament version. You have the, the transition being Israel taking the ark out of the tent, out of the tabernacle, and rushing out and going, we will do, God will save us. But in truth, when you see not the shadow, but the true, you see Israel taking the life out of the tabernacle, killing Jesus. When you kill somebody, you take the life out of their tabernacle. <clears throat> you see them willingly, willfully killing Jesus, and that's the true picture. And so you can say, you know, you know I know people who have read this story and they mourn with Israel. Oh, you know, like, you know, they were part of it or something. You know, we lost the ark. Oh, darn, maybe we can get it back. But the truth is, they didn't lose the ark. They gave it over into the hands of the Philistines. I mean, the true spiritual, and into the hands of the Gentiles in the, in the actual account in the New Testament. <clears throat> and so, um, pardon? Thinking they're doing, yeah, and but but here's the thing that gets me over these different shadows is, is that we hear we read these stories and then somebody makes those stories holy, not knowing that they represent Christ and Him crucified, and they are not, you know, there that cannot give you a clear picture, just as a shadow can't give a clear picture of what's going on, and so we memorialize it and romanticize it until you see it through the eyes of the scapegoat himself. And then you realize this picture is Israel taking the life out of that tabernacle and delivering it over to the Philistines so he'll die. But that's not the only picture going on. Uh, Book of Acts, what is it, chapter one or two, talks about the determinate counsel of God by foreknowledge planning the death of Christ, right? So that Jesus wasn't murdered, he was a, a willing sacrifice, right? But then that same scripture that by the determinate counsel of God, you with wicked hands have taken and killed the prince of life, okay? So... So uh, there's, two thi there's two things going on there. There's God's willingness as a lamb and a self-giving one to die. And there is the wrong motivations of individuals being exposed to. <clears throat> and such is the case here. Um, thank God for these shadows because they make, if you will, us appear better. I wonder how many people... I, I want, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking, this is me now, this is the Lord. I, I just wonder how many people have read this and they look at their church and they go, the glory is departed, oh Lord, come back, you know. Uh, well, that, I'm sorry, your prayers and your direction, it doesn't fit with this because he left this system and he's not coming back. He'll never, ever be in that tabernacle again. Ever. And the priesthood represented by Eli and Phineas and Hophni, they will never come back. And, you know, can you, I mean, many of you know the Bible well enough to know Eli and his son, Phineas, his sons, Phineas and Hophni, right? You know, you know the story. So can you see a beautiful picture of them functioning on the Day of Atonement as he's dressed in the, in the pure white and he's laying hands on the scapegoat and going, oh, Lord, we pass these sins, N knowing that Eli and his sons were every bit as bad as Annas and, and uh, Caiaphas in the New Testament. Every bit as bad, maybe, maybe worse. <laughs> but we get caught up in the romantic story of the thing instead of say God open my eyes that I see Jesus that I comprehend what's going on here so that I see the truth not 
not the truth uh, distorted, shadowed. You, you know what I mean. <clears throat> All right. So, um, <clears throat> let me just read this paragraph again. In the Old Testament, we, we read that the Philistines took the ark of God out uh, at the hands of Israel. When Israel took the ark out of the tabernacle and the Philistines took it from them, that was only a shadow. The true picture was more clarity to it than the shadow. The situation that took place that day was a picture of Israel handing Jesus over to the Gentiles for death. As the ark, representing the life of God, was taken out of the tabernacle, even so, the life of Jesus was taken out of his earthly tabernacle, his body. This represented his death on the cross. The Jews handed Jesus over to the Romans in order to put him to death. All right, so it's... It's the end of that system, and it's at the end of that priesthood. <clears throat> um, you know, it, it, it worries me. Uh, it worries me sometimes too, because uh, I wonder. I mean, what if everything that we have been taught on certain subjects is based on the shadow and not on the true? I mean, what if that was? I mean, not everything, but I'm, but I'm saying, what if? What if many things that we have held so religiously, you know, was really just a shadow picture that didn't even communicate the truth of Christ and him crucified? And that, that, that saddens me and it breaks my heart for me as well as anyone else. And I say that because I constantly pray God, please open my eyes, not so that I'll have something great to share, whatever. I really need to see Jesus, because if I don't, as we talked about one of our other sessions, I'm blind. And um, <clears throat> one thing that we left out when I spoke, but, but Nisi and I talked about later, is uh, probably, probably my most favorite hymn in the whole world is Amazing Grace. I love that hymn. I love the tune. I love the... You know, uh, however, one of the most detrimental lines is it, in it was, I, I once was lost, but now blind, but now I see. Because the truth is, we were blind, and now we're seeing. But we are still blind to a whole lot, and we still need the Lord to open our eyes. And the proof of that, Ephesians 1.17, Paul praying for the church. So this is God's people I pray that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the, you know. And so, so though they're saved, clearly you can't be in the church unless you're saved. Though they're saved, Paul's praying a prayer for their eyes to be open. And, and the only conclusion I want you to come to right now, it's not some weird deal, just simply this. Uh, Maybe I won't speak for you. I'm, but I am yet blind, completely blind to, to so many things of the Lord yet. And my prayer is, God, I am blind. Open my eyes to see Jesus. Okay, and and He did in this concerning this particular thing, um, but it it made me worry that we are so quick to grab stories and not ask for the truth. Anyway, that's enough on that. Um, all right, so in other words, the moving of the ark did not happen at Shiloh, but at the cross. So whatever story that was, it, was, it really wasn't even important as a historical story per se. It was only important as a shadow. And the, the removing of the ark was when they killed Jesus, took his life from his tabernacle. <clears throat> the taking of the ark by the Gentiles, the Philistines, pictured the life of Christ being separated from the incarnation body, the tabernacle, and beginning the transition to the resurrection body, which is the temple. So, before you weep, before you go into too much depression, you need to realize that if you look at it from the human side, it's just flat out tragic. You know, us, we are just tragic. But if you look at it from the Lord's side, 
he's working in all of this himself. You understand? He's, he, it doesn't matter if they by wicked hands, you know. I mean, see, we don't mind somebody, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how to put this. We don't mind somebody misusing us as long as we think that they're sincere and trying to be nice or something. But if somebody by wicked hands would nail us to our cross, you know, we only want, you know, I, I picture all these hippies coming and nailing you to the cross and singing and throwing flowers on you while you're being hung up there and you're going, oh, yes, you know, I, I don't think so. That, that's not the way it happens, you know. You don't get to choose your death. You don't get to choose who puts you on that cross. And nine times out of ten, it's going to be somebody that's really malicious, just for your information. Not that I would know that personally. But. All right. So, um, so there is this wonderful reality, this wonderful spiritual reality that is taking place. And that is that God is about to do a new thing that is so glorious, so above Jesus incarnate. It's called the temple. Ah. So to get that, we need to go back now and maybe we'll finally talk about John 2. Are you up for it? Yes. John chapter 2. Let's go. All right, just to make sure that we remember, we're going to just read a little bit. It's not a whole lot here, but John chapter 2, starting with verse 13. Now, remember, a couple of classes ago, we went over part of this. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money. Uh, and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things from here, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. All right. Um, just to make sure everybody's uh, with us. Uh, <clears throat> We talked about this thing of him driving uh, out these money changers and that, the, that if he had an issue, if he had an issue, the issue was you are profiting by sacrifice instead of losing. And that's completely contrary to life out of death, to selflessness, you see what I'm saying? So we went, we went over all of that. And yet that's the thing that that and other things that we ask for a show of hands. That's the thing that most of us think that Jesus is driving them out for. And we would have assumed that that was it because of his words in verse 16. Take these things from my father's house. We would have assumed that that was the whole purpose of everything that he was doing. But then, verse 17, and, uh, verse 18, then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Why are you doing these things? And now Jesus doesn't talk about money changers or a house of merchandise or, you know, being out of whack with sacrifice or stuff like that. Now Jesus is going to go, okay, you, oh, you're asking. Oh, you really want to know what's going on here? Well, I'm going to explain it to you. And Jesus' words are these. Jesus answered. There he is. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. All of a sudden, this has nothing to do with this 
driving these things out and, you know, today was a bad day, you know, because there were money changers in the temple. I had to drive them out. It has nothing to do with a bad day or a good day or money changers. He did that with clarity and they would have missed it had not somebody said, why are you doing this? Because they could, could they have not? Could they not have assumed that he did this just because he didn't like them making the house of, of his father a uh, house of merchandise. Couldn't you have assumed that? But somebody didn't assume it because if had the, everyone assumed it, no one would have asked him, now why are you doing these things? You get it? So there's something else going on and somebody had the adeptness to, to check in with the Lord and say, what is this? Explain this. Explain that. I want to know. All right. So let's see. And then we talked about the fact that it wasn't the anger of the Lord that drove them out. It was the zeal of the Lord. Right? It's a completely different thing. And um, let's see. I just want to make sure I'm covering everything. Uh, I wrote, and we read this last time, because his action was not based upon men's failures, his own anger, or writing a wrong situation. Um, and then, let's see. All right. So we're back to where I wanted to be. What has transpired in the taking of the ark is exactly what's talking about here. It's exactly the same picture. Um, this is what Jesus is referring to in John 2. If we return to John 2, we begin to see the same pattern as the taking of the ark by the Philistines. In driving that which is to be offered out of the temple, we see how Jesus lines the shadow up with the true. By driving out the offerings from the temple, he is representing the concept of death to sacrifice. Let me explain. The sacrifices represented himself as the only acceptable sacrifice. When those, and, and you know, Jesus really didn't rail on it. He didn't go, oh, that, that's, that, see that dove, that's stupid. I'm the, you know, or see that lamb, that's, that's really stupid. I'm the true lamb. He didn't rail on them. He railed on them making, you know, merchandise when it was supposed to be sacrifice. So it wasn't a situation of, of uh, uh, disagreeing with the sacrifice because to him, to him, he knew it was a shadow, but he knew that every sacrifice Israel ever offered for thousands of years represented him, the only true sacrifice, okay? Um, the sacrifices represented himself as the only acceptable sacrifice. When those varied sacrifices were driven from the temple, Jesus was giving us a picture of the religious leaders taking his life from him by removing it from the temple of his body. Do you see the same picture as with the tabernacle over here? And they took the ark of it. That represented, that's death. The life came out of the body and he died, and that's where the cross is represented here in this transition between these two. Well, this is exactly the same picture, because he said, they said, what does all this mean? What are you doing? Destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. All right. Just one, you know, uh, there's several things, and I'll read a little more. But isn't it interesting that the disciples later on, it says... Um, um, and his disciples, well, it says, and his disciples remembered that it was written, the, here's how we would word this. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal drove him to it. Because he was zealous. No, sir, no, sir. He did that because of zeal for God's house that was coming for the temple. He did that because it says he did it. He says, and they said, we get it. This is about your house. And this is about, and this driving out, this death 
is not murder. It is zeal as you go into death to build a temple, not just have a tabernacle for God. Does that make sense to anybody? That's the, that is clearly the wording. That is clearly the flow when Jesus begins to answer this. <clears throat> All right, so let me make sure I've got these bases covered. Um, <clears throat> I'll read this one sentence one more time. When those varied sacrifices were driven from the temple, notice the wording, driven from the temple. Folks, that sounds like death to me. Driven, the life, the sacrifice, the, the, the self-giving one, Represented in this picture, and Jesus giving a, a picture of it, driven from the temple. Jesus was giving us a picture of the religious leaders taking his life from him by removing it from the temple of his body. The driving out represents three things. The death of the sacrifice, because Jesus was a sacrifice, and he did die, right? So apart from everything else, by driving this sacrifice or driving the life, just like the, taking the ark out of the, the tabernacle on the ta uh, in the Old Testament, when, the light, when those sacrifices left that temple, it represented death. But to God, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. it. To God, it represented sacrifice. To those who wanted to kill him, it just represented death. We killed him. We killed Jesus. Right? See, it's all in how you look at it. When you look at it from God's side, it's a glorious thing. When you look at it from man's side, there's always maliciousness in it. Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought it was interesting that Jesus is, I get this. Now, we know that they killed him, right? But we also know he gave his life. Jesus is the one driving out the sacrifices, representing his own willingness for zeal to bring forth something that was not in existence yet, the temple. You see that? Yes. Yep. And the whole song is full of David going to death. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. The spirit of the zeal in that song yeah. is all death. It's all going to death. Well, but the, but the zeal here, I mean, yes, and that's right, but the zeal here is specifically for the house of God. He is driving those things out gloriously, representing I will go into death for my father because destroy this temple and in three days we'll raise up the, the true temple of God. Isn't that great? Yes. Hallelujah. <clears throat> All right, so rep, this driving out, driving out represents three things. The death of the sacrifice, which is self, a, a willing sacrifice, willingness. The crucifying of Christ and taking his life from his physical body, the temple, which is the Jews, the Gentiles killing him. And then finally, destroying one temple, the tabernacle, to raise up a greater one called the temple, which is the body of Christ. This building housed just Jesus. This building houses many, 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 many that become one. And they become one by the same life that housed this tabernacle, but now he fills every stone, every brick, every part, every one. <clears throat> All right. Also, remember that these very events are happening on the day of Passover. Remember verse uh, little up, 13? And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Well, glory to God, folks. I mean, how many witnesses do we need that this is talking about death, this act that he's doing? It says it's the Passover. That's the time that he died. That was the point when he gave himself a couple of years ahead and so he's not going to do it this year, but he is going to do it. He's going to do it in zeal. He's going to do it in type and shadow. He's going to walk into that temple, and he's going to drive out the acceptable sacrifice, and he's going to do it with zeal for the house of God. And he does it on the Passover, knowing full well what day it is and what he's doing. See? 
I mean, it could have said, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went out, and he went up to Jerusalem, and, you know, he hung out with the boys, or he, he healed a bunch of people. I mean, think about it. Come on. Or he, you know, there was this, this guy that, you know, the, you know, all the stories that could be out of all the stories. Jews Passover, Jesus goes up and he goes right into the temple and drives it out. And he says, this is a picture of me. And it's not just a picture of me dying in poor me fashion. This is a picture of me dr willingly driving out my own life, giving it, laying it down. Because I know that in the death of this tabernacle, this temple, three days, God's going to raise up one that was even better than that. And his zeal for this house is what caused him to do what he did. That's what was at work in him. Hallelujah. All right. Um, All right, so him going up on the Passover, I wrote, this is no coincidence. Jesus knowingly took this action on this particular day as a sign to those who might see. <clears throat> then uh, verse uh, 22, let's read that. <clears throat> when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which was spoken. Um. <clears throat> We see clearly from verse 22 that even the disciples did not get what Jesus was talking about until later. They didn't get it, right? They didn't get it, okay? Um, <clears throat> we can find this to be true in other places also. So let's, let's uh, keep your place here because we're not finished in John 2, but let's go to Mark 13. I want to show you another example of this. Different story, though. Mark, Mark 13, and we're just going to look at verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> and as he went out, and this is talking about Jesus, and as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? <laughs> There should not be one left, one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. <clears throat> All right. um, that's true historically, and it was also true of the old, if you will, tabernacle system being carried over into the um, Temple of Solomon. And it was. I mean, this is... Uh, you can get confused with this if you're not careful, and I don't want to confuse you. But Solomon's temple represented the resurrected church, the body of Christ. But it wasn't that. It was, only, it was still in the Old Covenant, Old Testament, right? So what did they do? Well, they went in there and they stuffed it, you know, they stuffed it with the laver and the... the um, altar and you know the blood sacrifices and all this kind of stuff and that would seem normal except for that is sort of continuing the old system in a new wineskin you, you sort of follow me and the reason why I say that is because that was a departure from what immediately came which we're not going to talk about yet David's tabernacle because David's tabernacle after these events with the taking of the ark was the first thing that showed up, not the, remember our ch other chart, not the temple of Solomon. And so, and we'll refer to this several different times in the course of our study, but James, when they're talking about a situation, James says, quotes, I think it's Amos, the prophet Amos, and he says, God says this, I will rebuild again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. Meaning, even Solomon's temple was just a shadow, folks, and they, didn't, they weren't out of the shadow yet, so they stuff it with all this late legalism and stuff like that. Uh, whereas David had the Holy of Holies in his backyard and just went in there and, I love you, Lord. <laughs> Praise God. 
All right, so I don't want to confuse you too much, so I'll just throw that out for your, for your enjoyment. All right. Um, uh, where was I? So the disciples were content to admire the greatness of the shadow. Remember what we read here in Mark, the temple, the greatness of the shadow, but did not see the body of Christ as Jesus understood it. Because one thing that you have to remember is that Jesus... Any time this thing of body or anything came up, he knew it was a shadow. He knew the temple was a shadow. He knew the tabernacle was a shadow. He knew that. Him and the Father and the Holy Spirit came up with the idea. You know, I've got an idea. You know, let's let that represent this until the dawning come. You know, so, you know, any action, you know, the disciples sitting there and going, oh, look at the beauty of this this temple, Jesus is going, oh, please. You know, there's nothing beautiful about it if it's just, if it doesn't represent the habitation of God. They didn't say, look at how God dwells in here, the house of God. They said, look how beautiful the temple is. Okay, the emphasis is on us instead of him. All right. Um, <clears throat> They saw it in its outward grandeur, but not as a practical house for God. For Jesus, the point's not about the beauty of the structure, but the purpose for it. Is it fulfilling God's intended purpose? A habitation of God, see? So, you know, we'll get into this, I think, uh, when we get into David's tabernacle a little bit. But, you know, so many of us, frankly, are worried about ourselves. We're worried about trying to beautify the temple instead of the Lord being the beauty of the temple. And um, it's, it, it, it is a hamster on a wheel because there's no end to that road trying to fix yourself up and, you know, overcome and do good. And... Not only that, but it's so completely contrary to the plan of God that you can't get there from here. Because getting there is the Lord inhabiting us. Okay. And we're so focused on ourselves. <clears throat> All right, let's go back to John 2. <clears throat> and uh, the good news is I'm only going to be able to hit a few more verses here, but we will have a summary in the next class of John 2 and everything up to this point. <clears throat> so that'll, that'll be good. We'll have a nice dividing point here. Verse 21. And he spoke of the temple of his body. <clears throat> so so here's, here's what I wrote. However, to know for sure that this is Jesus' explanation of the incident, meaning that it represented his death, and to know for sure that this is Jesus' explanation of the incident, we need to hear from him. Jesus lets us know that all that is going on here in John 2 is seen by him in light of his body, the temple. Well, what, where is he located? He's located in the actual big temple building, right? But Jesus is letting us know that this is not about the temple or the sheep and stuff or these people that are money changing and everything, that he's talking about the temple of his body. You following that? And he's talking about the sacrifice going out of that temple. He's talking about him laying down his life for zeal, for something greater than even the Son of God incarnate, something greater and more important to the church. Amen. Ultimately, Christ in you, Christ in us, us being a habitation of God, which is way down the road here towards Solomon's. But anyway, um, so... Uh, <clears throat> Jesus walked as the tabernacle of God, or the tabernacle of, of the Father. <clears throat> he sees things in clear light, and we see things in shadows. There's your problem right there. All right, finally, verse 22. <clears throat> when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which had, they had spoken. Um, 
And the disciples also bear witness that this is what he meant by equating this with Jesus' death and resurrection. When, they, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples <gasps> all of a sudden, oh my God, what he was talking about there is this. This is it. We get it now. But they didn't get it then, okay? You know, they didn't know what was going on. Well, Jesus is upset with, you know, doves or something. I don't know, you know. You know I, can't, I can't explain the master, you know. <clears throat> That's not at all what's going on. And so later on, the Holy Spirit brings them face to face with the death and resurrection. And all of a sudden, they remember that event, and they go, oh, that's what that was all about. Oh, my God. Jesus bears witness that that's what he's talking about. Destroy this temple in three days, I'll build it up. The disciples bear witness that that's the, what he's talking about. Let me make sure I got it all here. <clears throat> the disciples also bear witness that this is what he meant by equating this, with Jesus' death and resurrection, they believed the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament, and the words of Jesus' explanation given concerning this incident. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's take a break.